Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here today, and I'd like to thank Dave and Julien for the opportunity to present to you and to share what we're doing, and hopefully this will lead to some collaborations, and look forward to your feedback. Um, so before I begin my uh, the talk on, uh, like uh, Dave was saying, interdisciplinary is a very key word. So for the last uh, 15 years, that's all I do is interdisciplinary research. Uh, I know the limits of my discipline, right? being trained as a cognitive scientist or a cognitive psychologist, that I cannot live alone. I need the education people, I need the computer science researchers, I need our AI researchers, computational modelers, and right now, uh, colleagues also in terms of natural language processing, psycholinguistics, etc. So there's always a team approach, that's very important. You will see that throughout my talk. Uh, also, the fusion, uh, not because I like to eat, but uh, fusion is important. We have to need to fuse different models, different theories, different methods, and also learn from each other. Okay? We'll talk about some of that too. And measuring. So we have been, and I'll use the word obsessed in a non-clinical version, okay? we have been obsessed as a research, uh, a research team and various teams on measuring metacognition. Okay? Starting with my training here, just like uh, Julian's at uh, McGill University as a PhD student in cognitive science, everything was focused on cognition, cognition, cognition. Then as a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon in psychology, it was more cognition, cognition, cognition. We buried the motivation, we buried the affective processes, okay? And we talked a little bit about metacognition, okay? But it's become very apparent as we build these advanced learning technologies, and they can be intelligent tutoring systems or ITSs, multi-agent systems, hypermedia, multimedia, doesn't really matter what it is, you'll see some of those. We need to basically, uh, I'm using metacognition in kind of the meta level in terms of it's really cognition, metacognition, affect, and motivation. So how do we look at those four critical aspects of a human and what, how are they deployed in real time to make a system intelligent, okay? And some of you who are familiar, like Jacqueline like Boudreau is in the audience, familiar with the intelligent tutoring system uh, area, of course, and AI and education. Intelligence is broadly defined as we want to make the system as adaptive as possible, okay? And to provide the individualized instruction that each student needs, okay? So we'll talk a little bit about more of that. And of course, over the years, uh, so after I left McGill you know, a little over a year ago, um, while I was here, it was heavily funded, very fortunate to have funding from, uh, of course, the CFI and the CRC and also SHRC, and it was very actually uh, atypical for somebody in the College of uh, the Faculty of Education to get NSERC money, and we did get that, so that was very good because we also do basic psychological processes where we induce emotions, negative emotion, and we see how people regulate their emotions. But also in the States, before coming to McGill and after leaving McGill, uh, been heavily funded, been very fortunate to be heavily funded by NSF and uh, NIH and the U.S. Department of Education. And this is very important because in order to do this, it basically, I mean, let's just be honest, it takes a lot of money, okay, and a lot of people to do this, so. Um, so let's start. Uh, so here's, I can show this video clip, but you know, here's a typical student, and I will use metacognition and self-regulated learning interchangeably, okay, strategically. So a typical student in the lab comes in, they're gonna use some kind of advanced learning technology. This happens to be a, an early version, an unintelligent version of MetaTutor, okay. So we have a student who's basically, you know, uh, learning about the system in a laboratory. And so here is, uh, oh, actually, you know what, it's okay. We don't have to hear her sound, because I'll tell you. So you probably can't hear, but that's okay. So the question is, is this student self-regulating, okay? Is she using cognitive, metacognitive strategies? Is she monitoring her learning, et cetera? This is a typical concurrent think aloud protocol, okay? This is the old days where, you know, most people are just collecting think aloud protocols. We did that a lot, okay? But the question is, are we capturing everything, okay? Are we capturing her, you know, what does her posture say about, not just what she says, but what does her posture say, okay? She's just reading out loud, okay? So if we're doing a think aloud and you're coding this, you're not really capturing the metacognitive processes. Okay, and an example of that would be, let me, sh let me make her quiet for a second, okay? So metacognitive processes would be that she may be reading and then she says, I don't understand that. Oh, as a psychologist, that's wonderful. I don't understand that. I mean, that's segmented as a metacognitive process, right? So then the question is, as a psychologist, I want to know what she does next. Because if you are saying that you don't understand something, either verbally or behaviorally, however you measure it, I want to know she's being adaptive. Right? A typical student may go back and go back and reread 
right? That could be adaptive. A student can also just then proceed, continue reading, okay? So if, but look at this. We, all we have is her verbalization, and we have a log file data, which obviously is not present here because it's running behind the scene. We only have two pieces of data. So we're making lots of inferences about these processes, and we can't do that. So the message is, how else can we instrument a student to collect those rich trace data of cognition, metacognition, emotions, and motivation? Okay. Also, uh, if we had an eye tracker, imagine how much more, okay, in terms of inferences and how more accurate we can make the inferences. Because even if she says, I don't understand this, she can go back and read, okay, but if she's silent again, she's just scanning, guess what? You become silent, that means I have no access to what you're doing. But you can still be silent, and if we had an eye tracker, right, we can also tell if she's actually rereading or not, okay? So this is kind of the impoverished uh, version of this. And this is what we see a lot of the research in, in many of the disciplines, right? People making inferences. They do a pre-test, post-test, and they're making inferences about processes that students used, depending, on, let's say, on an experimental condition. And we're saying, well, hold on a second. You can't make those inferences because you don't have the data, okay? So here's the big question that basically, you know, how do we know if she's self-regulating and what's the evidence, right? So we need to instrument and to actually be able to collect evidence and to triangulate evidence. So um, as a kind of an overview, there are basically five themes that we deal with, okay? We want to examine the role of these, so I'm going to use the acronym CAM for Cognition, Affect, Metacognition, Motivation. By the self, by the person, okay? But it can also be externally regulated, okay? And this could be... If we think of a developmental psychology, a parent, okay? It could also be a teacher, okay? It can also be an artificial agent, whether it's an avatar embedded in a multi-agent system like we have, okay? So it can be human or non-human, okay? And so the question becomes, what is the role and what is the synchronicity between self and external, right? We, while they're using these computer-based learning environments, so advanced learning technologies, right? and we do work both in school, so in STEM, Okay, and also professional domains such as medicine. Okay. Secondly, we also do basic and applied uh, psychological research in the lab and real world classrooms. So we do stuff in the lab, in the classrooms, but we also work, for example, here we're still working with a medical simulation center, which is located in the basement of La Cité that belongs to McGill University. And we also now work with the same center, well, similar center, but at Duke University okay, in, in, um, in Durham. Okay. But we also, we've also done work with breast cancer patients. So the Royal Vic Hospital here in Montreal, we would basically, and I'll show you that, we would work with breast cancer patients who've just been recently diagnosed with stage one and stage two cancer. Okay, how can we build systems to help them understand the basics, the biological basis of breast cancer? Okay, and more recently, uh, <laughs> the National Security Agency, the NSA, the famous NSA, has built a multi-million dollar facility on our campus, and we've been the, one of the three universities that has been given some money. We're looking at intelligence analysts. So when you have a military analyst that belongs to the CIA or a civilian analyst, okay, and something like an IED, okay, a bomb goes off, all right, so the question becomes, they have access to tons of data, whether it's video data, chatter, okay, language, etc. The question is, how can we build a system to actually improve their job so hopefully we become safer, okay? So many applications. We collect different types of data, and this is really what I want to focus on today, is the different kinds of data that we collect, and the nightmare, the good scientific nightmare, of trying to put it all together, okay? So we do things like, going back to that video, we collect eye tracking data, log file data, facial expressions of basic emotions and learner-centered emotions, okay? So we want to know, for example, when a student is angry, when they're angry at their avatar, why are you angry, okay? What's the antecedent to that anger, okay? Can you regulate that anger? Okay, or confusion, which is a more learner-centered emotion, or frustration. I'm getting frustrated because this biology content, okay, or this particular diagram is too complex for me, and I'm a novice learner, or I'm a middle school kid. Okay, and then the thing is, can, you know, in physiological sensors that we started using recently, like the EDA or the GSR, as it used to be called, and we just started uh, testing some uh, EEG. Okay, uh, fourth is. We, unlike most of the world that really comes from the developmental sciences, learning sciences, and educational psychology, where they try to treat things like motivation as a self-report measure, 
Okay, we're saying don't throw it away. Okay, and that's what a lot of obviously uh, some areas of psychology have done. You right? you test motivation by giving somebody a self-report measure. Right, so you have a statement like, "Yes, when I study for science, I ask my teacher for help on a scale of one to seven. Sure, seven. Of course, I do that. Right, on paper, we're all the best students. The question for us, right, who are interested, we want to see is that untemporal, temporal unfolding of these processes. It's not like we're interested in your perception of how you do it. We want to see actually how you do it. Yeah, does that make sense? So we're kind of this in constant battle with some of the motivational researchers. Okay, that exists, and also the affective scientists. So we're interested in the temporal unfolding. You know, how does it unfold? Uh, cognitive, the CAM processes. And we're also reaching the limits of our statistical methods. All the stats that we've learned in grad school and that we teach, okay, they're quite limited. Let's just put it politely, okay? Because they make some assumptions. Well, when you're collecting, for example, think about protocol, okay, trace data, it's not normally distributed, right? Well. But yet, we have to run inferential statistics to get it published because, hey, that's what's going to get you in, you know, developmental science or a journal of ed psych, right? Otherwise, you're going to go to a second or third tier journal. So the question is, we need to work with statisticians to start developing new methods to look at this complex temporal unfolding data, whether it's time series data or dynamic systems approach, etc. And we're also, uh, so most of our new projects and grants have also experts who tend to be computer scientists who, let's look at data mining, okay, which data mining processes can we use, and then machine learning to making it actually adaptive, okay, so, uh, and then of course, if we knew all these things, then we can design these intelligent learning environments or training systems, okay, to be able to detect, so when do these CAM processes unfold in real time, okay, can we track them, can we model it, and who's modeling it? Is it the machine that's modeling it, or is it the machine and the human, or humans that are modeling it? Okay, and how do you coordinate all that? And then there's the instructional component. If you can detect, track, and model, then you should have be able to make some kind of inference as to how to support it. Okay, so is it an avatar going back to social psychology in terms of grounding? It's like I, I see that you are frustrated, right? What's causing the frustration? So, for example, in a human-machine interaction, it could start a dialogue. Okay. Assuming, of course, that the student is aware that they're frustrated. All right. All right. Uh, so basically, a lot for learners and trainers, but we're also now getting into the issue of teachers. Okay, how do we train teachers? We keep blaming kids or students for not being able to regulate. But the question is, let's go back and let's see how the teachers are being trained. If the teacher does not know how to regulate, okay, has never been taught, then how can you possibly do that for your students? Okay, and think about especially the motivation, never mind the cognitive or metacognitive process, but the motivation and emotions component, right? You see your student is frustrated, what do you do for that student? So let's go and look at what teacher training, and I can tell you that in the States it's pretty uh, impoverished, if you will, depending on the state, okay? When I was at the University of Maryland, I used to teach uh, educational psychology and cognitive psychology because I figured if you're going to be a teacher, you should at least take in a course on, you know, how people think, how humans think. That's like becoming a surgeon without taking anatomy. Yeah, it's going to go in there and you know, my jinsu knife. You, know? so like, you should at least have a basis, right? So yeah. So these are the kind of the themes and overview that we talk about. Uh, for the cluster hire, so in North Carolina State, uh, we three years ago decided to hire 45 people uh, from outside, uh, meaning experts in different areas. So we have medicine, uh, statistical analysis, et cetera. And so I'm, in, I'm one of four people right now. We're still looking actually for one uh, higher. We're, f we're gonna be five in total. It's, and we're looking for someone who's an expert in AI and games, okay? And that'll be in the computer science department. So I'm in psychology and I have two colleagues, uh, one in computer science already, and then two in education. But this is just to show you the lay of the land, okay? We, we don't live alone anymore. I mean, I'm a psychologist. You know, I've been in experimental psych programs. I've been, um, in cognitive psychology, right now, you know, I'm in human factors. We just changed our name from human factors and ergonomics, to human factors and applied cognition. But you know, psychology, and we know the limits. I mean, I work with people in education, of course, depending on their expertise. Uh, let's not forget cognitive science, learning sciences, and of course, this is the other group of people that are extremely useful and that we collaborate with because without them, we can't do any of the modeling. We can't build those systems. Okay, and one in particular is the affective computing folks. 
Okay, those are extremely uh, important. So, for example, my colleague James Luster. Okay, we have two grants together. We also work with Christy McEnany, who's at British University of British Columbia in computer science. Okay, looking at eye tracking, for example, and emotions. Uh, just like we work with also, we have a grant also collaboration with Claude Frasson at the University of Montreal and his colleagues. Um, and then we have the people who make our computer environments, of course, pretty, right? Because there's nothing worse than building one of these and you're showing it to a middle school kid and the kid's like, yeah, you know, that's not boring. And then, of course, hey, I'm not a, I'm not a biologist, I'm not an oncologist, okay? So we also need a domain expert. So we work uh, with medical professionals, crime investigators, STEM teachers, etc. And here's a potential list of some of the themes in our research that cuts across. And what I really want to focus on today is show you some of these CAM processes and how we collect them, okay? With the focus on measuring them in real time as much as possible and what are some of the issues, okay? Um, so going back to actually my PhD in 98 at McGill, uh, we've done a lot of work. So for example, we started actually the dissertation was uh, so the radiology tutor, so we worked with physicians. This was to basically train uh, radiologists, especially mammographers, on how to interpret mammograms. Okay, this was an original ITS that we developed back in 98. Uh, very well-structured task. We've also, as a student at McGill, and under the supervision of Suzanne Lajoie, uh, this, actually, if you squint, that's me. That's how I supplemented my, my shirk, okay, graduate uh, fellowship by actually pretending to be the patient in this clinical scenario. So this is the SICU, and if you're familiar with the SICU, is a place you probably don't want to ever visit in your life. It's a high-risk environment where patients are on the verge of dying. If it had been in an accident or it's post-operative and they're on the verge of dying. Um, so we go from a very well-structured domain. You got one anatomical region, okay, that you can, and perhaps 18 different differential diagnoses to you ask five experts, they'll have five different ways of solving this case. This person who's been in a motor vehicle accident is about to die, okay? We've also worked with colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Uh, so one of the issues in the States, of course, uh, lawsuits are great, unlike in Canada. You can sue everybody, not here, right? So one of the issues is, uh, this is to teach pathologists who are looking at slides for dermatology and cancer. The problem is that they go through the slides really quickly, okay? You have that schema rigidity of being an expert, so guess what? When you do make a mistake, you end up paying, and so, so does the hospital. So we actually embedded some metacognitive tools to slow down the diagnostic reasoning process and to make them really think about the diagnosis that they were providing. Okay. Of course, they didn't like that because that means you're slowing them down. That means they're not getting this. Right? You get paid by the number. With, with kids, we've also done things like uh, teaching them causation and correlation between chemical indicators. Um, and this is actually one that I have right now with Gautam Biswas, who's at Vanderbilt University, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. And we're taking Betty's brain, which is an environment that he's developed, and our meta-tutor, and kind of mashed it together. And the approach is that we're working with middle school kids, both in Nashville and in Raleigh. And the idea is that as students, we never get to see who we are in acting. It's almost like seeing an, an out-of-body experience of yourself. Right? You're just, you just act. So the idea here is, instead of the kid teaching Betty, which is what he does in the other system, is that the kid is given a STEM problem, like okay, a middle school kid, and basically the, the, the student has to teach not only the content, but to teach his or her own agent or avatar who they are as a self-regulatory being. So if I'm given a problem, okay, they get a, a palette that talks about cognition. So how much knowledge do you know about this? So imagine having a slider. I know a lot of it, okay? All right, so let's talk about emotion. Well, this is a really complex problem. Uh, how, you know, what's the probability that you're going to get frustrated? Oh, very high, okay? What's the probability, for example, in terms of motivation? Things like, how do you value this task? Do you care about it? Uh, not so much. Okay, now we start getting into problems, right? Because now we got... So what they do is they basically build their own avatar, and the idea is that then the avatar hovers over the screen and basically enacts, okay, what they said they were going to do, all right? And at any point in time during problem solving, they can stop the system and say, you know, I wanted to summarize the content, but what happens if I make an inference, all right, okay? Is that any different? So it's also part simulation. So they get to learn the conditional knowledge of metacognition. Yeah? 
So this is something of the things that we're doing. Uh, MetaTutor I'll show you today because that's kind of the data. That, so this has been funded since 06 when I started at Memphis in psychology with colleagues like Art Gracer and Daniel McNamara. This is himself. This is a, a, a new version. We're actually using uh, University of Southern California's uh, Intelligent Virtual Human Toolkit. Okay, Because we figured that one of the things we're noticing is that using the haptic agents, they're two-dimensional and the kids can't really, they don't really respond to it. Okay, So here we've got not only three-dimensional, but obviously one of them will pop up but they're actually being more expressive. So imagine having an agent now that is able to trigger a metacognitive judgment because you're reading, okay, and you're using the wrong strategy or you're not metacognitively monitoring your, your content, your understanding, and the agent in real time, in terms of synchronicity, goes from being neutral to looking confused. <laughs> so we're trying to figure out is, if the human doesn't trigger the metacognitive judgment, right, when I look at my agent, who's supposed to be my helper, Right? The fact that they're confused, does that trigger the metacognitive process? Okay. So all those feedbacks. And then this is the one that we developed. It's a light version, a light version of MetaTutor called the Virtual Self. And this is the one that we developed with colleagues uh, here at uh, the Royal Vic uh, to teach uh, women who are recently diagnosed with stage one and stage two cancer because all they really get is, you know, you come in for post biopsy. You sit there and then you go see your oncologist and you know if you're unfortunate to have stage one or stage two basically all they do is give you a glossy handbook and we said look we can do so much better with that we can take that glossy handbook okay of biomedical knowledge related to breast cancer we can not only put it in a computer environment but let's build one where the women can actually you know interact with an agent and by the way this is a criticism that we had for most of the patients she's too young I want to know an older agent. It's like, okay, we'll work on an older agent. Uh, but more importantly, imagine you have the, the, the goal was to have a system that would be able to detect their affective state, the woman's affective state, be able to provide emotional regulation strategy, okay, so they can reduce their affective states, so they can actually cognitively pay attention to understanding the biomedical knowledge, okay, so they can ask uh, more informative questions, okay. So now we kind of switch over to self-regulation. I'm, I'm not going to bore you with theory and models. I try to resist as much as possible. I did have a diagram there. I'm like, no, 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 put it away. <laughs> so self-regulated learning. <coughs> uh, so we see this from different uh, areas. Uh, a lot of the work is done also by some of our, um, not only here in Canada, obviously, such as people like Phil Winnie, who's at Simon Fraser University. Okay, probably one of the, we tend to use his model because he's got an information processing model. Uh, of self-regulated learning, but also social cognitive model like Zimmerman and Schunk. Okay, and then we also see the emergence now of people going beyond self-regulation, socially shared regulation. Okay, it's like okay, well, how is that different? All right, so that's a lot of the work by uh, Alison Hadwin, who uh, is at University of Victoria, and one of our colleagues in uh, Olu Sanayarvula, who does a lot of this work. But we tend to make, I just wanted to kind of, you know, as we use this as a model, is that you know, we make some assumptions that learning is contextual. And this creates a problem. That's why we don't want, nobody wants to talk about this, right? Because the question then is like, are you going to have a, a model? Is your model of self regulated learning only when they, for this, for this group of kids or this group of professionals using this particular advanced learning technology? Agency, we. <coughs> Excuse me. Have to build these environments to provide agency. Students need humans need to express agency. Otherwise, you're inhibiting them. Right? Goals and standards. Okay. We assume that yes, this is a basic assumption. If I you give me two hours to work on, let's say I want you to solve these ten physics problems. Okay. I know what I need to work towards. Okay. Now internal standards are the most difficult ones. Okay. Because those are the ones that we all have as humans. Okay. And the question is. When we, we have no idea what they look like, okay? Because sometimes we say, well, a kid, a student, a professional is not regulating his or her learning, right? They're not being adaptive. Well, do we know what their internal standards are? How many times have they done this task? Are they novices or experts? You know, how many materials have you given them, okay? So one of the things that we're trying to do with some of our colleagues is try to figure out a way, perhaps using augmented reality, is how can we start tapping in to something that is so buried okay, in our skull in terms of internal standards? What does it look like? Okay. 
Uh, monitoring and control is extremely important, right? That's basically I'm monitoring my learning and I'm controlling by using some kind of strategy. Uh, it's self-regulation is an event. It happens in real time. It's not self-report, okay? And there are many feedback loops and, you know, we look at the temporal dynamics and, of course, self versus other. So if we have a system, you know, how much is that system, whether it's advanced learning technology, how much of that is providing that other self-regulated learning? And in order with that, we also have things like, in terms of metacognition, right, people also talk about metacognition as this unitary, it's, it's one mechanism. No, it's not really one mechanism. We can break it down into judgment of learning, feelings of knowing, okay, and then it's more even more contextualized because, let's say, they're using a hypermedia environment where you have multiple representations, text, diagram, and some can be static versus, let's say, a video of an open surgery. Right? Uh, so you can have content evaluation. All right? And then the question becomes, so here's an example. So in terms of we not only go to the macro, metacognition, micro could be a judgment of learning, but then also at valence. In our coding scheme, we're becoming, so we have these three uh, tiers, if you will, because it is important for me to understand, okay, as a psychologist and as the designer of a system, whether a student says, I don't understand this versus I understand this, right? Because then your control strategies following that should be different. If I'm reading and I say I don't understand this, adaptively I should probably go back and reread or ask the avatar, what should I do next? Versus I do understand this, that's fine. It's almost like a check mark. And all you see behaviorally is a student continue to read because adaptively that makes sense, okay? But we have, we run into problems when they say, I don't understand this, they continue reading. So, so all of a sudden throws us off, right? Why, why are you continuing to read if you just said you don't understand something, right? So the question becomes, is it because they like the content? So there's the hook to motivation, but we have no idea. So we need to tap into that, okay? Or they're going to read maybe a sentence or two to figure out if their confidence in that, and I don't understand is right and then go back. Right? Or what happens if they continue reading really fast and don't stop? Right? This becomes an instructional nightmare because we have no idea when are we going to intervene. Right? And if we're going to intervene, what are you going to say for the student? We have no idea. Okay? Most of our, I hate when my colleagues don't like to say when I say this in educational psychology, but most of our models of learning and instruction are impoverished. They're too, too high level. Right? Some of our colleagues use Piaget. Great. You know, assimilation accommodation, yeah, it's wonderful. Gee, what, when does that happen, right? When somebody's interacting, let's say, with a, an artificial system. We don't know. I mean, it'd be nice to open the skull, but we can't do that, right? Even then, probably don't know. Um, or everybody else loves to use Vygotsky, right? Oh, it's a zone of proximal development. It's like, really? Gee, what does that look like? How distance, how, you know? Uh, we don't know. Okay, so we, we need to do some of this uh, work to figure out if, um, what exactly are these processes, when should you intervene, etc. Uh, and so this is for metacognition, but if you're looking at strategies like inference, they, the valence actually has a different meaning. Because here it's whether you made a correct inference or accurate versus incorrect. Okay, does that make sense? And so what we want to do is we'll show you today some, some of these, the difficulty of making some of these data-driven inferences from different multi-channel data, okay? So we'll be done with this soon. So yes, we need to integrate models, right? We need to have perhaps a model that integrates CAM processes, okay? Because right now, for example, we have Winnie's information processing model of self-regulation. Then we have Reinhard Peckman from Munich. We have his, you know, emotions uh, model, right? Uh, Klaus Scheer from Geneva, we have an, a computational model, okay? Motivation, we have a social cognitive model, and the question is, can we somehow figure out how to put all this together, okay? Self-regulation is an event, which I've already talked about. Here's another issue that we deal with as the designers, as psychologists and designers of these systems. What are we supporting? When you build a system, right? Are we supporting your cognitive skills? The fact that you need to understand data-driven reasoning because you're a medical student and that's what you do versus hypothetical deductive reasoning? Are we supporting your metacognitive knowledge and your ability to monitor your emerging understanding? Okay. 
Or is it purely content? Right? I'm just, you know, if you look at the old intelligent tutoring systems, that's really what we focused on, right? On specific subdomains. All right? Or is it specific? You know? Uh, it would be nice if people started figuring out, you know, can we build these systems that also support motivation and emotion regulation? Right? So for the student doesn't care about this content, task volley, that you see a lot with middle school and high school kids, right? Oh, what do, I, what do I have to learn about phosphates and nitrates? You know, I want to be a, a, a physician. It's like, uh, okay, are you listening to yourself? What do you, what do you think a you know, physician does? Okay, so how do you teach that? That it's relevant, that it's important. Okay, uh, when to scaffold is the other big deal, right? The timing. We have no, no idea what the timing is. Okay, and if we see dysregulation, what does this regulation even look like? Is that maladaptive behavior? Okay. So the idea here is that a real challenge for is intelligent adaptive support based on real-time diagnosis. Okay, and I'll show you that in a little bit. Right? Even if we knew what these things meant and what they're classified in real time, can you imagine then the delay that it would impose on the machines for the machine to also then be able to integrate that okay, and react to the student? Right? Uh, and then how to support it. So if you look at the literature in the AI and the literature, the ITS, affected computing, so many of us are using pedagogical agents. Uh, we try natural language processing, which becomes a nightmare when you have kids, okay, or novices, because they can't express themselves properly. I can, we can express, two people can express the same thing, but write totally different things. And here's the machine trying to figure out, you know, what, what are you trying to say, okay? Um, some of the work that's been really interesting uh, that we started to use is Judy Kay and Susan Bolt, who've done these open learner models. Uh, Judy is at uh, Sydney and Susan, Susan Bull is at Birmingham, and open learner models, which, you know, let's take our, make our inferences that we're thinking about in terms of your processes and make them part of your interface, okay? So we have inspectable learner models, which will allow me to monitor because they're feedback, okay? But imagine having a system where you have a manipulable open learner model, okay? In order to trigger metacognition, let's say the system represents visually, okay, and underestimates on purpose, for example, how much you've learned, to see if the student actually is aware that, no, you're making a wrong inference, I actually know more than you're saying that I know. Can you imagine that level of sophistication? Okay, we tried this with middle school kids, of course, uh, even the reviewers came back, it's like, I think you're asking a little too much. Adults can't do this. All right, all right. Uh, and then, you know, things like intelligent virtual humans, so there's different ways of doing this. So this, this, this is a big, a big uh, nightmare, but it's, it's a good nightmare. It keeps us in business. Okay. The, then if we're talking about the data itself, uh, the detection, right? So a lot of people are focusing on product, and product by product, kind of, you know, pre-test, post-test, learning outcomes, etc. Everybody has used, we, we continue to use self-report data, but focusing on process data, which is that rich trace data. And we get into other questions, right? Sampling, how much do we have to collect? All right? What's the temporal alignment? This is the biggest issue. Okay, how do you go to align EEG data with eye tracking data, with concurrent thing allowed protocol data, and log file data? Okay, when they're all at different sampling rates. All right. So here we are using the SMI. Okay, sampling at 120 hertz. So we got 120 dots per second. Okay. So imagine that. That's one second. In that one second, somebody could be reading content, and they're all saying is cardio vac. That, that's it, okay? And I'm making that to, you know, to make it really um, contrasting, okay? And everything else in between. Um, it's extremely important in levels of explanation and granularity, okay? We still have colleagues who are only using log file data and making inferences about metacognition. And we're like, you know, you should probably just add at least another data channel, okay? Because that's, that's quite the, the inference, okay? The analysis, we go back to that stats issue, you know. Is it data driven? So when we work with, of course, data mining and our machine learning colleagues, of course, just feed it through the machine, right? The brute force. So we get these clusters, they're wonderful, right? But then we have the problem. We try to apply a theory, and it's like, uh, some of these things don't make sense, right? So how much noise is there, and what do we do with it, right? The context is really important, right? So. When we look at folks who do, for example, sequential data mining, right, guys like our colleagues, um, um, Gautam Biswas, right, most people are doing dyads. I did a cognitive process, then it was a metacognitive process. Well, is that the inner analysis? 
two, the dyads? Should it be a triad? Right? Four, five, six? Right? If you just do it bottom up, then we ask these questions because how do we, when do we impose context? Right? Maybe those five processes were done while they were inspecting, let's say, a paragraph. But the five could also be, you know, can account for maybe, let's say, five minutes of behavior. Okay? So where, where do we draw the line? So, but of course, working with them is, is interesting and I think has a, a lot of, of, uh, of use and okay, utility. The other issue that people don't like to talk about is qualitative differences okay, in our self-regulatory competence. Right? When does a student show that, oh, now okay, they're much better or more self-efficacious, to use a motivational word, that they can use inferences as a high-level strategy? What does that look like? Okay. Is it because at the beginning they were trying to make inferences? Is it the low frequency and the fact that they were not doing it so well? Versus, let's say, the next day, which probably won't happen that quickly. We can only, we can only hope. Okay. That now the frequency has increased. And guess what? The accuracy has also increased. Right? So how do we... Is it a time issue? And behaviorally, what, what's that signature? So we talk about behavioral signatures. Right? And then, of course, the inferences for modeling, scaffolding, the design issues that we'll get to later. Try to... No, I... All right, so just to give you an overview of, of MetaTutor. MetaTutor is a hypermedia environment which uses text and diagrams to help students learn about complex science topics like the human circulatory system. The main purpose of MetaTutor is to help students learn to better self-regulate their learning by deploying appropriate planning, monitoring, and learning strategies. MetaTutor interface consists of different parts. The content area is where the learning content is displayed through the session in text form. Learners make metacognitive judgments of their learning at different times during the session. Students can navigate through a table of contents at the side of the screen to go to different pages. The sub-goals, Erner said, are displayed at the top middle of the screen, and they can manage sub-goals or prioritize one here. A timer located at the top left corner of the screen displays the amount of time remaining in the session. The overall learning goal is displayed at the top of the screen during the session. A list of self-regulating processes are displayed in a palette at the right-hand side of the screen. Students can click on them throughout the session to deploy planning, monitoring, and learning strategies. Static images relevant to content pages are displayed beside the text to aid learners in coordinating information from different sources. Text entered on the keyboard and students' interactions with agents are displayed and recorded in this part of the interface. Four artificial agents help students in their learning throughout the session. These agents include Gavin the Guide, Pam the Planner, Mary the Monitor, and Sam the Strategizer. MetaTutor is designed in a way that all interactions of learners with content, agents, and the learning environment is recorded in logs for further detailed analysis. So that's just a little bit about MetaTutor, and it's open source, so as long as we have the content, we can you know, change it. Of course, we would have to change the pedagogical aspects to a certain extent. This is what it looks like now, um, and since I'm trying to regulate my time, uh, so we make a whole bunch of assumptions based on the cognitive task analysis about these CAM processes, and we also, of course, have embedded assessments. They create sub goals while they're learning. Okay, they have different layouts, so the student can say, you know what, clean up all this stuff. I just want to focus on reading and looking at the diagram of the heart. We have quizzes. We have metacognitive judgments that they make. Right, so if you are going to leave too early, in other words, you want to go to another sub-goal, okay, and you haven't spent enough time, so based on the production rule, um, Mary the Monitor actually kind of lock you in, it's like, no, you haven't seen enough pages and you haven't done enough, and by the way, your quiz score is really bad and you're overconfident because you think you're, you're done with this section, okay. Uh, so in terms of kind of a... You know, how do we analyze this data? Because it can be at so many different levels. So if you have a typical, you know, our typical study, pre-test or post-test, okay, students may look at, may set two sub-goals, systemic circulation, pulmonary circulation. While you are uh, learning, 
there's, you know, you can engage in lots of knowledge construction activities, like you can take notes, draw, etc. You're also going to have quizzes periodically, okay? So the question for us as researchers are, okay, so where, okay, while most people are just looking at pre and post things, because that's easy to do, right, it doesn't take much, the question is, if you want to look at the process data, so if you look at this one little pixel right there, okay, the question is, that pixel could represent the fact that Gavin gave you some guidance as to what he wants you to do, okay? You may have looked at different pages. You may have given, gotten feedback, okay, or scaffolding from Sam the Strategizer, and then Mary the Monitor regarding your metacognition, etc. okay? So it could be this, so the question is, is this your unit of analysis as you think about the decomposition of self-regulatory phenomena, right? Or can you go all the way down to, you're just interested on the particular focus, okay, or fixation on a particular word or diagram on the page. So your, your job as a researcher is to try to figure out, right, where in here, okay, do you lie, based on your research question, of course, and your hypothesis, okay, and the different methods and tools that you should be using. So that's a real challenge. Um, here's another way to represent this. So what tools do we have at our disposal? Right? So if you look at process, product, self-report, knowledge construction, right? just focusing, and if you think about the CAN, cognition, metacognition, affect, and motivation, using you know, the green light, red light, and, and yellow, yeah, the light signals. Okay? If you look at the process data, well, if you do screen recording, like we all do, I think most of us, with Camtasia, you can, you, because you have audio and video, you can probably tell a lot about their cognition, metacognition, but guess what? Not so much about affect and motivation. Think alouds, even though they're the obviously ch obvious choice for looking at cognitive and metacognitive, sometimes you actually get verbalizations related to motivation or emotions, like I hate Sam, okay? Or, you know what? I'm not interested in learning about the mitral valve. I'm gonna go somewhere else, okay? So here's a potential blueprint as if you look at the product data, self-reports, and other, okay? And of course, you know, this is by no, 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 it's not really complete because even the physiological sensors, I kind of dumped them all into this category, okay? These, each one of these should have their own row, okay? So that's not complete or not is the other category, okay? Because sometimes you design interface elements to look for specific CAM processes, okay? Data collection, here's a typical data collection. So um, for affect recognition and classification, uh, the eye tracker, we used to use the Toby, but uh, as I was mentioning to David and Julianne, in a two hour experiment, okay, after an hour basically it would start overheating and shut down, which is wonderful if you're collecting data. Um, learner dialogue between the agents and the students, the self-regulation palette, the screen capture, the log file data. Note drawings and notes that they can do both externally and internally. And we used to, we started using Affectiva when I was here. There's a picture here at McGill, actually. The Affectiva, they went belly up. So now we're using Shimmer, which I think comes from Ireland. Kind of interesting. Uh, and then think about protocols, okay? And so sometimes we present to teachers like, well, how, do you, how the heck do you expect us to do this in the classroom? Well, it's easy, right? Well, you don't have to have an eye tracker, right? Because obviously, unless you're rich and you can provide 30 eye trackers in one room, uh, however, I've seen, I've seen close to that at the University of Tübingen in Germany, right? So you can get rid of this, right? And of course, you don't want 30 think -log, concurrent think -log protocols at once. Everything else, there's no reason why you can't collect it in the classroom or even asynchronously in any other place. Okay? So here you have your multi-channel data that you can collect. In terms of the madness here is, you know, if you think about this as a pretest and this as a post-test, okay, and the self-report data, and let's say you have some, you know, model, it could be a model of skill acquisition that goes through three phases or self-regulatory competence development, all right, notwithstanding the self-report measures that can be done pre and post and maybe at certain periods in time, and your product data, it can be three types of learning outcomes, declarative knowledge, procedure knowledge, mental models of a particular biological system, pre and post, what we're really interested in is in this trace data that happens here at the bottom, right? So these different colors could be, so this, imagine this is the eye tracking data. So I'm using kind of the, the density, the closeness to represent the, uh, the uh, sampling rate versus a think aloud protocol versus, let's say, an EDA bracelet that you have, et cetera. And so our big question is, yeah, anyone can do this. This row, we're all, we can all do this. This is okay and kind of interesting. The more interesting part is, this stuff, right? So using data mining, 
machine learning techniques, can we may start making inferences about how either each individual channel or across channels are predictive of things like selling quality sub goals or predictive of changes in mental models, right? Or even more difficult, people talk about self-efficacy, right? It's the hallmark of motivation. How do we know when there are, there's a particular change for a, in terms of one's self-efficaciousness for a particular strategy, not just because I'm self-efficacy in terms of strategies? So this is kind of where the playground where we would like to, you know, of course you can add EEG, of course, and all that here. Uh, this is where we want to go. This is another way of representing it as you align the data, okay? So from the facial expressions also. Imagine you had a way to actually not only collect the thing about protocols, but code them in real time. That's what this basically represents. And intersperse that with uh, actual knowledge acquisition, okay? And so in terms of the data, I'm sure all of you are familiar with log file data. That's kind of boring. Everybody collects that, collect data at the millisecond level. We use different techniques to actually analyze this data. Um, that's not the very exciting one, but the exciting one I want to show you is... Hello? It's tired. Is bizarre. Okay. Good progress. Okay, there we go. Okay. Hopefully, it won't shut down. It overrode my my bad decision. So yeah, so here we have, you know, we used to use face reader. Um, here's a facial expression. Uh, so just looking at basic emotions and all that. We used to see a lot of neutral. And so the question is, why do we see neutral when the student, for example, is learning about the circulatory system? But more importantly, is to move towards the more learner-centered emotions. So this is a, you know, the, like the work of my uh, former colleagues, uh, Grayson and DeMello. Uh, so we want to know when students is bored, right, versus confused. Right? So confusion, we know that... Uh, Confusion and extended points of confusion usually transition to frustration. And if you don't take care of frustration, then there's a complete disengagement. We don't want to do that. So, so what, we, what we don't want is, you know, of course we'd like to see a lot of happiness. That, that rarely occurs, okay? Uh, neutral is very important to us. What is, you know, neutral, of course, not being an emotion, but what is the role of neutral, okay? Is it that the, or no, right, no. Is it that the organism, right, going back to, for example, Grayson theories of emotion, that if something is relevant to the organism, then I should be able to express somehow facially, physiologically, uh, behaviorally, um, some, um, negative positive affect. So there's a neutral meaning that basically they don't care. Okay? Versus uh, confusion. So we're definitely looking more at confusion and frustration because those are the two negative affective states that we don't want them to engage in. Okay? And we need to understand why. The antecedents, how long, when does it happen, how long it happens, and then are we effective in trying to get them to rearrange, uh, to reappraise themselves. Then one of the other ones that I want to focus in is in, you know, and we can reconstruct all kinds of representations from navigation patterns. This is somebody who's gone very linearly through the text, but went back to a couple of pages. But more importantly, this is some of the recent work that we did with Christina Canati at UBC and her colleagues. So kind of taking the gaze behavior patterns that we see from college students as they've been up, uh, looking at and uh, learning about the circulatory system. And can we tell from their gaze behavior, okay, whether they're engaged or disengaged? using some machine learning techniques. And so this is extremely powerful because it looks like students who are engaged, and this is with about a 60 to 70% level of, of accuracy, which is good, okay? Uh, so they tend to go from the overall learning goal, which is this, to the table of contents, okay? 
And if they're reading, they tend to go back to the diagram. And we know from cognitive psychology that this coordination of information source is extremely critical for developing a mental model of a biological system. As opposed to okay, being disengaged. Okay? Looking at the agent, okay, and looking at the diagram, or the self-regulation palette, and the overall learning goal. So the idea here is, if we can do this post hoc, okay, we actually, with one of our software developers, uh, hacked into the SDK for the SMI, okay, and basically, now imagine doing this not only uh, post hoc, but doing it in real time, okay, so that now, the interface, you have an intelligent user interface that changes based on who I am, what I'm doing, and whether the system is classifying me as engaged versus disengaged which could include triggering the behavior of a pedagogical agent. Okay. So that's some of the things that we want to do. Now, to show you, close up here in a bit. Uh, the thing that doesn't do justice is we have these static diagrams of this rich data, but until you see the data kind of as a dynamic, and this is an integration of screen recording, think allows, and the eye tracking, to actually give you a feel for how complex these issues are. Okay. So you have a student So you'll see the fixation being overlaid. Get him to talk. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quiet them down for a bit. So this is just to show you that the simple di static diagrams of data that I just presented to you do no justice to the temporal nature of this. And you see how rich it becomes when you get the dialogue from the agent, the dialogue from the student, what they're exactly looking at, the activities, and also their gaze behavior. And there commences our nightmare of trying to integrate this into a cohesive um, model of self-regulated learning. And of course, an adaptive and intelligent learning environment. Okay. Um, time. So the other thing we're trying to do is I got two students who are interested in pupil dilation in terms of starting to look at cognitive load, okay, but not from a self-report measure, but in real time. Okay, and what does that mean? And looking at blinks. Okay. The other thing we can do is because we have created the content, we can tell when the student is basically cutting and pasting into her notes as opposed to paraphrasing. So it might be that at the beginning because we know that she knows very little based on the pretest or from a teacher that she doesn't know this, it might be okay because she's getting to take notes. But the question becomes again, at what point do we need to wean the student off just copying verbatim and say, you know what, and now it's time for you to start paraphrasing. Use a more sophisticated strategy. We have no idea when that's supposed to happen. Okay? But we can track it. Right? Uh, other things, so we get to this issue of the other big issue is a computational issue is here's some data on the different metacognitive processes and you know looking at the average. On the metacognitive process, when the student verbalizes or from an utterance, okay, on average it's about three to four seconds. Okay? And this is post hoc. So imagine what it would take for a machine to be able to get the utterance in real time, classify it based on one of these metacognitive processes, okay, then be able to, within a very short window, Okay, to change the agent behavior, it could be marry the monitor or send the strategizer because we've got learning strategies, so it can be adaptive, as opposed to it just waiting for a student to do something else. Okay, so there are many computational issues, and we get uh, here at the end in terms of inferences. So if you had a choice between log file data and eye tracking data, okay, this is kind of a sequential process that we as researchers kind of don't engage in, right? What are the behavioral signatures? Do they provide the same behavioral signatures? Okay, even though one you're talking about gaze behaviors and, and uh, fixations and regressions, the other ones you're not, you're talking about a sequence. Okay, now the question becomes, are any of these things indicative of self-regulatory processes, whether it's metacognition, cognition, emotions, etc.? And if they are, what are we making decisions based on? Is it time thresholds? Is it frequency? Is it a pattern of, of thresholds and frequencies? Okay, 
And if we're able to do these things, then this here is the instructional implications. Then what, what inferences can we make regarding things like modeling, scaffolding, fading, okay? When do we do it? How do we do it? Should the agent do it, okay? Does it have to include a gesture, right? Or is it only verbalization, okay? Many of these questions, uh, this is what kind of drives us uh, insane. And to kind of finish off, because I'm a little over time, I apologize for that. Uh, this leads to some of our new collaborations. So in the last year, we've been very active. Uh, that's one of the, the wonderful things about being in North Carolina is that we have the three, you know, three top universities, North Carolina, Duke, and uh, UNC Chapel Hill. So with our colleagues, we're using the same techniques with uh, James Lester. This is Crystal Island, which is uh, basically it's an outbreak, and it's not Ebola, uh, of, on an island, okay? And it's a game, game environment with a specific narrative, okay? Um, we also work with Duke, not only with ma uh, the mannequins, in terms of human, human, and a mannequin, but also they have developed several serious games, either first person, so one of my master's students is actually looking at emotions, and how do you teach a medical student who has just been on rotation for anesthesiology to intubate a patient, okay, and then select a whole bunch from a whole bunch of anesthetics, which one is the best one to give, okay? Some patients are normal, one of them actually was his face was basically blown off by a sniper, so he can't lie down. And the first thing the students try to do is get him to lie down, and he actually uh, becomes combative because if he lies down, he actually suffocates, okay? The other thing that we're doing also is with Michael Young, who's in computer science and AI games, and uh, we have a college of textiles, which happen to be uh, chemists and physicists, um, is when there's a crime, it's, this is called the IC crime game, it's uh, also funded by NSF, is when there's a crime, they actually go in and scan all the entire crime scene, all the rooms. Okay, so that's the real uh, picture, okay, of where the crime happened. They recreate it in the virtual VR type system, okay, where you can have two detectives actually going through the crime scene, okay, and they can tag the evidence. So we're looking at collaborative problem solving, okay, and the quality of the tagging that they're making and the inferences. And also this is used for presentation to juries in, in a courtroom, okay? So these are some of the environments that we're doing and uh, some of the other work that we're doing that this is actually here, McGill, that we're still continue to work this with uh, at Duke is look at negative emotions in medical decision making. We're now talking about a uh, full high fidelity mannequin, okay? So this woman is pregnant. She's got a pulmonary embolism and you have 10 minutes to save her life. If you don't, not only will she die, but also her baby. So outside the room are the medical students, the medical residents. They're wearing their bracelet, their EDA bracelets. We're getting baseline on them that they don't know about. They're reading the clinical history, okay? And then behind another one-way room is our team, my team, and the physicians who came up with this scenario, plus the computer scientist who's actually manipulating the mannequin and will talk as if she was the mannequin. So what we're trying to do is how much, you know, does emotions play in terms of breaking down the medical decision process because the team leader has to monitor his or her own emotions and the entire team. So if they're doing something really well, they'll do a critical incident, like we'll drop the blood pressure, which obviously you don't want that to happen here. The question is then how do they react or do they freeze? And what's interesting with these residents is that many of them engage in quote unquote bizarre behaviors. They don't know how to react to the situation. Okay, and then there's a debrief, which is actually worse because they get to sit with the faculty of medicine who wrote this right after they do this, and they get to sit and they watch the video, and we'll talk about fixation errors, right? For for example, you never look at the patient, and you always have to look at the patient, okay? Or you you didn't do something right. So it's a very high stress, high inducing. So we're trying to figure out how does emotions play within the team environment. And that's one of the things that we're doing, uh, continue to do. We also do this with, uh, we've done this with pediatrics, which is actually, it got me running out of the room and crying because I got a seven year old. So they have a baby mannequin and you have the pediatric residents and it's even worse because I mean, at least, you know, she's an adult, but when you see a child and the child's just crying. So the scenario was that they were on the playground, child fell from the monkey bars and there's massive internal bleeding and the child is going to die. Okay, so it's interesting when you talk to the different residents and the physicians, the different mindsets 
when it's an adult who's dying versus a child who's dying, that's potentially dying. Okay. So, interesting. So, the other thing that we're doing is trying to bring in, and this is the last thing, learner analytics and teacher analytics. So, you know, here's the old boring classroom. I think we have them everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Got a teacher, got kids, this kid, I don't know about this kid. He looks like trouble. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not too sure about this thing, right? Probably, it looks like they're using Word. <laughs> Very exciting, okay. The old, you know, whiteboard. And so what we've done is with one of my colleagues, Min Chi, who is in computer science, and Jeff Green, who's a, a learning scientist, is write a grant for NSF. Where would it be nice? What happens if we change this environment in that each of these kids? Imagine each of these kids, okay, using MetaTutor to learn about circulatory system. The multi-channel data that I've already presented to you, okay. How much of that data can be used to make this system more adaptive to each individual kid, okay? And then at the same time is, how much of this data, we're gonna replace this boring, unintelligent whiteboard with some of the data that we're collecting on these kids, okay? And some of it, if you notice, is some of the data that I presented to you, okay? So we're thinking about what is individual student data, because I only want to see it on this kid, because this look, kid looks like he's trouble, okay? Or aggregate data, to be presented on an intelligent data visualization tool, and then try to figure out the teachers wearing the you know a wireless side tracker and the EEG, okay, what information is she attending to? Because the goal is to have this information give her additional information for which she can make better instructional decisions, okay. Without of course without inducing extraneous cognitive load, right. So yeah, so this is something that uh, we're working on, and we have a school board that controls 130 schools throughout the state of North Carolina that is very interested in this, in terms of supporting their teachers. So we can also, you know, it's not just about the students, but it's also about the teachers. Um, and just to finish off here, so we have obviously some of these challenges in terms of frameworks, models, uh, theories, etc., and some opportunities. Uh, one of the big opportunities, of course, is the scalability, right? That's always a big thing. Most of the Granting agents wants to know, okay, that's great, you can do this in the lab and the classroom, but how do we take this into the real world? That's fine. 21st century skills is important, and then we need to broaden our interdisciplinary boundaries. So we're starting to also work with, you know, biomedical engineering, because eventually, I mean, we already have, you know, devices attached to us as organic material, right? Inorganic or organic material, so that's going to increase. And then kind of revisiting the whole, there's a whole field called BCI, or brain-computer interaction, right? Or, as I learned, the A, little a, BCI, affective brain-computer interaction. And how can we rope these people and these folks in, right, to do some of this uh, work uh, to augment what we already know? So that's what we're doing. These are the current projects, and these are the new ones from this coming year. We're also looking at haptics in terms of how uh, you use haptic devices to teach blind students. I've got a colleague of came and talked to me and I'm like, well, I've never dealt with blind students, but sure, I mean, how can we use haptics to inform and teach the students about acceleration, velocity, friction, etc. And of course, this can't be done without a wonderful team of undergrads, grads, postdocs, and uh, a whole slew of collaborators across, across the world, in Canada, U.S., and across the world. And, uh, you know, and then that's, uh, and just in North Carolina, North Carolina State and UNC and Duke uh, in the last year, there's just a tremendous amount of opportunity for doing very exciting work. And of course, agencies and the former current students, and I apologize for going over, and I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Roger. Any questions? How do you synchronize uh, data? Well, you, you mentioned it was a kind of a challenge to temporarily synchronize data, but you use Affective uh, bracelets and other types of, how do you actually synchronize them right now? That's, yeah, that's a big question. How, how long do you have? Uh, <laughs> so we've been, let's see, we try different techniques. So we, to the easy answer is that we've bought uh, Noldus, yeah. of, um, the Observer XT, which is not doing Observer X, uh, 13, right? So we're trying to do that as much as possible because all we've been doing in order not to prevent to prevent that bottleneck is basically looking at each channel separately, right? So now we're kind of in a good space where we're starting to combine two channels, you know, or three channels. 
But the thing is, now we also have equipment for my emotions and software for my emotions, which, you know, we can use the Shimmer and the eye track, and they're trying to sell us their eye track, and it's like, look, we don't need that. We already have the gaze that does with, deals with SMI. So it's... it's uh, but the time clock of Effectiva mm -hmm. has, has its own fine data, or do you actually... Yeah, you well, know? that's that's the... That's one of the, the problems, right? Is getting to the proprietary. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a problem that we many of us have, and it's a problem that I mean, I, I really don't know what the solution is, right? Because we're spending lots of money buying proprietary software, right? That people are guarantees it's going to work, and you're going to be able to integrate all this data. Then we get it, and it doesn't work that way. So, like for example, this morning I just for be be alert. I was telling uh, you know, and, and, and Dave that you know for be alert. All of a sudden, because we're going through a third company, they're like, "Oh no! For additional software, you need to go back to you know, AB, you know, and get their software." And it's like, "No, you have to be honest with your with your clients, you know." Um, th but this is one of the biggest the biggest challenges. Um, a second approach has been to work with computer scientists. This is why it's nice to be at NC State because we have relationships with now about ten computer scientists. But it's the same thing. Like one of them is interested in not only Roger, give, give us all your log file data, and we can use some genetic algorithms to look at your log file data. And that's great, so we develop a relationship, but then it's like, all right, Dave, you and your team have done that, so now how do we bring that back into, you know, with the eye tracking data, for example? Yeah. So I think as a community, we need to figure out a, a more strategic way, whether it's an over-dependence on companies who promise a lot and don't deliver that much. <coughs> Because, you know, we're not in this industry, we can't afford, I, I mean, I wish I could afford like 50 programmers, that that's all they would do, right? I mean, that would be one solution, but that's not cost effective, so. Uh, the other thing I think is that we need to start as a community sharing, so that, you know, we don't have five people working on, you know, oh, you know, this is how, five different pieces of software that do the same thing. No, let's just focus, let's get one group that's excellent at doing something and get them to do it, and we'll do something else, and then share tools. Right? And I don't think we've reached that point yet, which is unfortunate. Because I guess we're just finding out from each other who, who's doing this work. Right? But, yeah. but that's a true bottleneck. This is why we, we, the advances have been so slow. Right? So with Toby, we've never published anything with Toby. We've had Toby since I was in Memphis for five, six years. Until I started working with Christina. It's like, look, we'll do it. But, you know, look. You know, we have to throw half of your participants because we got missing data. All right, so we go from 100, like, okay, 50. Okay, with the 50, you know, 80% of those 50 are okay, but we still have to get rid of them. And then we're, so what, we got 10 participants, you know? Yeah. So we should, we should talk yeah. about, because I love to hear, I love to hear your, I love to hear your strategy, you know? My uh, research center, at least, uh, what we did is we worked at the uh, lowest level, building an um, experimental uh, setup where every uh, source of data is uh, controlled uh, and pre-synchronized with other sources of data. So what you get is a pre-synchronized set of data mm -hmm. um, uh, on, let's say on a DVD, you have the video, you have mm -hmm. the audio, you have everything. And so if you want to check on one sec what happened at that point mm -hmm. of time, yeah. you have all sources of data that mm -hmm. appear on your screen that you can interpret uh, in parallel. Okay. Yeah, and that's kind of what obser um, the um, Observer XT allows you to do, is to bring in the multi-channel data. But then you also have to have a signal to synchronize. So for example, you start to experiment. It's either a sound or, or, or light signal that it's to align the data. Uh, but what you're also describing, uh, Jacqueline, is um, some of the work that we started doing with uh, Krim, with Francois Labonte and uh, Claude uh, Chaplin at Krim. They're developing, I mean, they, they do it for, for videos, right? Um, for kind of non-scientific non approaches, but there's no reason why they couldn't use their uh, uh, tools. To do that. Well, in our case, mm -hmm. the, the clock, the computer, is controlling the time of all data sources. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's very simple, it's a simple yeah. solution, but very low level. Low level, yeah. So then when you get to the high level, that, that's what's, you know, even being off by a frame, 
right? I mean, that, that's, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's problematic. Yeah. And the other problem when you have multiple computers. Yeah. No, no problem. We yeah. do. Yeah? Okay. Can come and visit. Okay. Come and visit. Yeah, that'll be good. Yeah. Yeah, if you have different computers, different clock cycles, different. Yeah. Maybe a short question. Um, that was great. Um, I'm, I'm sold with, with all this learning technology. And, uh, but I was wondering, OK, you, you want the optimal setting to have the optimal feedback that you can give to the student, for example, for to optimize learning uh, for like in class online as possible. But are you also considering that all the the improvement of, of cognition or processes are also dependent of, of you know that learning is, is not always right now, is it needs a couple of days and, and, and then then you just realize suddenly uh, so are you looking at also uh, in time I mean long long range time? We have. Right, um, but that's one of the difficult parts. Yes, so it'd be nice to have trace data over a year, over five years, ten years. I mean, throughout somebody's lifetime, right? But it's it's just difficult to do, right? I mean, it's hard enough. Uh, like the the longest experiment we've ever run was three weeks, and that was for self-regulation training, for metacognition. Yeah. So even between the far transfer tests to get people, I and mean, we're paying them twenty dollars an hour. So even to come back on the fifth day, it, I mean. It basically, it's extremely difficult to get people to come back. And then we would love to do that, so when we go and talk, when I go and talk to schools, to the administrators and principals, the immediate reaction is, uh, no, you can't come in and do multi-day experiments because it's going to take instructional time, and at least in the U.S., the, it's all assessment driven, right? So then the question becomes, all right, well, let's develop a relationship so that, for example, our Sim Self project, We've actually are working with a teacher, and we've taken her notes mm -hmm. on hydrosphere that fits with the science standards in the U.S. and fits with the state standards. And I said, that's great. So, so now we have a real reason to work together, and the purpose is to at least follow the kids for two years, which would be an improvement of what we're done. Otherwise, we can go back to the lab and just continue running, you know, 30-minute experiments, two-hour experiments. Yeah. So it's let us let us in, let us help you. You know, and in some places, uh, like when I was here at McGill, I mean, it was really hard to get into the English school board, right? I mean, after meeting and meeting and meeting, it's like, look, we're not charging you for the software. We want to work with you. We want to help these kids, right? So you ended up working with the uh, private school in McGill, the all-girls school. I forget, um, forget the girls, all-girls name. Oh, yeah, come on in, you know? I mean, we had full access to the girls. And then we're like, you know what? But these are not the students, these are private school students, these girls like would put undergrad to shame because they know how to learn. So it's like, okay, so we're, we're building these tools, but you already know how to do this, so we're not really helping you, you're just giving us access. So it's kind of the opposite problem, right? Yeah, give us the kids who can't read, who don't know how to regulate, right? Who get frustrated, yeah. So I don't know that, unless some, some colleagues in our, in, in, in AI and Ed and ITS to develop, you know, virtual virtual students. We can run virtual students, right? <laughs> Put in five thousand virtual students and just run their data. But yeah. That what Matuda is doing. Matuda, yeah, yeah. 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 Noboro Matuda. Yeah. There are two questions there. Sorry. I understand that you are interested by the variables of the subject mm -hmm. and how we learn and everything. But are you also interested in? how supervised and unsupervised learning algorithms may adapt your software towards the, the needs of the learner. Because I know it's very interesting these days that people are checking at machine learning techniques yeah. and such things. Yeah, that's something that we are interested in. We haven't started doing that. That's with uh, some new collaborations. Because it seems quite linear as a software. Mm -hmm. Some things are changed, but it's not adapting itself to be... Yeah, and that's actually one of the, uh, the issues with MetaTutor is that it's got a localized student model. Mm -hmm. Right, so yeah, because to get a, a more in-depth student model, yeah, we would have to use the machine learning techniques. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so looking for us, the students don't pick up on that. Even though the production rules, some of them are probabilistic. Mm 